Well, good afternoon. It's great to be back in Northeast Florida. I've got a couple of announcements. First is we introduced a couple days ago uh, down in Miami at Hard Rock Stadium antibody testing. This is the testing to determine whether you have antibodies uh, basically means you've had the disease and in a disease like this we know that there are many many more asymptomatic carriers than, than uh, carriers that develop symptoms so this is a way to identify that. What we're going to do here in Jacksonville is at the Jacksonville Jaguar Stadium starting tomorrow uh, we are going to be offering antibody testing for healthcare workers and for first responders. So that will start tomorrow, Saturday. We're able to do 100 people a day. And part of it, it is a blood draw, so it's a little different than just getting swabbed. Uh, but the good news is, is that you will have the results in 15 minutes. It's a, it's a rapid result. They put it in and, and it's, it's pretty neat how it goes. So I think that that'll be very uh, important. If you have healthcare workers who have the antibodies, then that confers, I think most people believe, uh, immunity. We don't know how long or, 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 or to what extent, but certainly people do believe that that's a, a level of protection. And then it's also just important to know how many people have actually had the disease. You have who test positive, but if you're somebody that has it and never developed symptoms or had very minor symptoms, then you probably didn't go in to get tested. And so the serological and sero seroprevalence studies that have been done around the country suggest that the number of people who have the antibodies is orders of magnitude above the number of people who actually test positive. So that has important implications for how we, how we um, combat the disease. I want to thank Secretary May Mary Mayhew, uh, our uh, ACA secretary. I also want to thank Jeff Frazier, the owner of Dolphin Point. Uh, we're here at Dolphin Point to highlight what, what I believe is a successful approach to helping our residents of long-term care facilities uh, in the fight against the coronavirus. Very early on, uh, we knew that this was a disease that had a disproportionate effect on elderly and f particularly elderly that have uh, comorbidities. And so under Mary Mayhew's leadership, uh, we acted very decisively early on uh, to protect long-term care facilities. And if you look at what we've done, we've put forth huge amounts of time, effort, and resources to protecting long-term care facilities. Uh, we very early on rest restricted visitation. We, Mary, uh, required all staff to be screened for sickness and coronavirus symptoms. We required all staff to wear PPE, and in accordance with that, the Division of Emergency Management has now sent just to long-term care facilities in the state of Florida almost 10 million masks, a million gloves, and half a million face shields. And so wearing the PPE is important, but the state has put the money where its mouth is and has delivered a lot of PPE just to these facilities. Uh, we've also had teams from ACA and the Department of Health go particularly to some of the facilities uh, that were considered more vulnerable due to their track records, uh, identify uh, infection control protocols, uh, identify needs, and be able to, to assist uh, as need be. We've sent National Guard strike teams, 50 teams, four member teams to long-term care facilities to do effectively surveillance testing to try to identify uh, the disease's prevalence in any of these facilities. And then if you find infections, to be able to isolate that cluster so that it doesn't spread to the f throughout the facility. And we think that that's something that's been very, very effective at limiting some clusters where they've been found, particularly in Southern Florida. We also this week debuted uh, the first uh, ever Cepheid mobile lab rapid testing RV. Uh, so we f outfitted an RV with a Cepheid lab. This gives 45 minute test results. And so what we're doing is taking that around to different parts of the state, fanning out into the various long-term care facilities, testing both residents and staff, you get the results back same day, and we're able to do 3,500 tests a week 
just with the Rapid Mobile Lab. So this has been a game changer for us. Uh, it's in Miami a couple days ago, Fort Lauderdale, I think, yesterday, and then today it's going to end up in Palm Beach, but we're going to get it all around the state of Florida, which is very, very important. One of the things Secretary Mayhew understood early on is that we have thousands of long-term care facilities in the state of Florida. We have some facilities that have the ability to care for a COVID patient and do appropriate isolation procedures. They have negative pressure rooms. They have an ability to isolate, but we have far more that just simply do not have that capacity. And so she recognized early on that you could not tell hospitals to send in COVID patients back to a long-term care facility that was ill-equipped to deal with a COVID positive resident. And so she worked with hospitals uh, to be able to prevent that. There's a lot of other states that force these patients back into those facilities. The results of that have been disastrous. So Mary was very creative in how to approach it. And here is a good example of really leveraging great resources in a way that improves safety uh, for everyone, but particularly for our senior citizens. Um, this Dolphin Point uh, facility and ACA have partnered, and this here is a secure location that will exclusively care for medically stable COVID positive patients who reside at other long-term care facilities. And so if you have infections at a long-term care facility, a resident goes to the hospital, Fortunately, in some cases, they don't need to be on a ventilator on the ICU, but to send them back to that facility, if they don't have the ability to isolate appropriately and have the negative pressure, that runs a risk of creating an outbreak in the facility. And so here at Dolphin Point, those residents are able to come here in a secure environment, in an environment where they're able to uh, effectively isolate COVID positive patients and obviate a potential outbreak at some of these other facilities. So right now there are currently 17 COVID positive patients here. They think that they're gonna receive another in the next, uh, uh, another seven positive in the next 24, 48 hours. And this is not just people from Jacksonville, this is the whole region. And actually they've had people as far from Monticello, Florida that have been here. So this serves Dolphin Point as a step up for COVID positive residents from nursing homes and assisted living facilities who may not need to be admitted to a hospital and a step down for residents discharged from the hospital who may not be ready to go back to the facility of their residents. And so this partnership with Dolphin Point is in line with our administration's efforts to protect vulnerable populations uh, from COVID-19. So this is an important uh, transfer protocol uh, and Mary's worked very hard on it. I think it's gonna definitely uh, be very positive going forward. We also are we're now requiring, and we do have the capacity to do this, that if you have a resident at a long-term care facility, go to the hospital, even if unrelated to coronavirus, that before they're discharged back to a long-term care facility, that they're tested for COVID-19. And if they test negative, then obviously they can go back. But if they test positive, some of the, either some of the elderly don't show strong symptoms immediately, you'll be able to see that. And then again, by not sending them back there, preventing a potential outbreak. So that's something that's very, very important in terms of protecting the most vulnerable uh, in our society. Mary has also worked, and the, and the good thing is, is she's worked so closely with all the hospital systems. She's worked very closely with the long-term care facilities. And so you have a lot of these hospital systems uh, have great protocols in place. I was at Halifax down in Daytona Beach a couple days ago. They, any non-COVID patient, they test before they send back. And then any COVID positive patient does not get sent back to a long-term care facility unless they've had two consecutive negative tests. Because I think the hospital systems understand that you know, they, they obviously want to have capacity to do elective surgeries, all these other things. Uh, but if you have an outbreak at a nursing home, you could end up with dozens of patients coming into the hospital. So it's in their best interest to make sure that they're not sending people uh, who, who may still be ill back there. So I think that that's something that's been very, very good in terms of, uh, in terms of how this, this practice has, has worked in Florida. And I think that's one of the reasons. I mean, if you look, some of these states, like New York, have five, 6,000 
nursing home deaths. You know, Florida, you know, we're obviously much lower than that for the whole state, for everybody, and we have two million more people, but there's a bunch of other states that have real, real problems, um, you know, with this, and, and I think it's really focusing on where the risk is. And so, Mary, I think she's done a better job than anybody in the country in understanding this, uh, the, the risk and, and supporting policies uh, that would reduce the risk for our residents of long-term care facilities. I also want to just say I'm going to have the secretary come up and, um, and say a few words, but I also just want to talk about some of the trends that we're seeing in Duval County. First of all, statewide today, the state is going to report having received almost 20,000 test results statewide, and roughly 361 of those have been new positive cases. So the percent positive uh, roughly, I think, is going to be about 1.9%. Uh, that is probably as low as we've had since the beginning of the epidemic, but we've not had anything above 5.5% for probably two weeks. And that's been a very, very good trend. So as we expand testing, you're finding fewer and fewer people that test are testing positive. We're starting to test really in the last few weeks. We've been testing more people who are asymptomatic. Uh, used to be that the testing was reserved because there just wasn't as, enough tests initially for the sickest of the sick. That has been really expanded where pretty much anyone can come to these drive through sites. But you're looking at 1.9% statewide. That includes Miami in those numbers but if you look at just duval county and look at what they've done they've had um really i mean sometimes four cases 17 9 i think they're we're going to report six from yesterday those are for a, a metro area for a county of a, th a million people you know those are very very low numbers but look at the percent positive in duval county the last many days one percent yesterday 1.3 percent the day before may 5th 0.7 percent of all tests are coming back positive. That's 99.3 percent tests are coming back negative. 0.9 uh, percent on the fourth, 1.9 on the third, and so that is a great trend uh, for Duval County. But you also look at how are the hospitalizations and all these other things tracked. You remember three weeks ago, Mayor Curry allowed recreational access to the beaches in Duval County, and that created a, a spasm from media in the Sella Corridor who are out of state. Um, they don't care as much about the subways and things like that that have been very problematic, but they really cared about people walking their dog on the beach in Jacksonville, Florida. And they were sure that this was gonna lead to just a massive combustion of coronavirus and they were predicting doom and gloom. Well, what's happened since then? So three weeks ago, the hospitalizations in Jacksonville related to coronavirus have decreased by almost 30 percent. Patients in the ICU in the last three weeks have decreased by 60 percent. Patients on ventilators have decreased over the last three weeks by 47 percent. So all those people were wrong they smeared people in Northeast Florida un, un, uh, unjustifiably. And now that you have the facts, how many people are now going and talking about Duval County nowadays? It's drive-by smear and then pretend that we're not going to remember what you did. Well, we remember that. We have the facts. And if you follow the facts over the narrative, then you're going to be much better off. But that's what the mayor did here. And I think that's why Duval County has done very well. Uh, so I'm going to bring up Mary Mayhew to, to say a few words about this. And um, we'll hear. We, are you going to say some stuff too? Sure. Okay, well, let you then, then do it. Okay, Mary. Good morning. <clears throat> Thank you, Governor. From the very beginning, the governor set the foundation for the seriousness with which we were going to proceed in Florida and he established the expectations for leadership to protect our most vulnerable. This was not going to be business as usual. I took that very seriously and we have worked in collaboration around the state to make sure that front and center we had the interests of our elderly, our most vulnerable individuals with underlying medical conditions to make sure that every decision was made to protect them. And I, I want to just focus on Dolphin Point. 
I can't tell you how important this facility is for our state's response. The leadership it took for Jeff and the team and the nurses and the staff and the owners to say, we will be a COVID designated facility. While we reopen the state, this becomes even more important that we have the opportunity to make sure that two cases don't become 20, that five don't become 50, that we are able to transfer an individual who needs a little more clinical monitoring because they're COVID positive. They need that isolation and then can safely recover and be returned to their homes in that skilled nursing facility or in that assisted living facility. This is the model. And this is the model that we are going to build on in our building on around the state. And I just want to express my incredible appreciation for the governor's leadership and for the team here at Dolphin Point, for Jeff Frazier, for what they've done. This wasn't a uh, we did not have to really pressure Jeff and the team here. They paved the way. They had the vision. And I am incredibly grateful for what they are doing here, for the care and attention. And I know, Jeff, you personally uh, have been bedside uh, supporting uh, individuals when they've been transferred here. And I, I just I can't tell you what it means uh, to me, and I, I have heard personally from other members of my staff, from members of the Department of Health, how uh, impressed they have been with the strength of your leadership and what it means and the difference in the lives of the people here in Florida. You are saving lives, your team here is saving lives, your nurses are amazing. Thank you so much. Well, it's kind of hard to follow all that. Thanks for building me up a little too much. But um, I do want to say, uh, first and foremost, happy birthday to my beautiful wife. Yeah. And <laughs> my three kids at home, get back to your schoolwork. Um, I want to say thank you to the entire team here at Dolphin Point. My other two partners, Jeff Cleveland, Sean Nelson. We have our partnership with JU. JU is building a foundation on expanding the nurses that we can have in this facility and around the state doing a tremendous job. Um, thank you to our caregivers in, in the building and our medical team. They're over here to the side. They um, they're are what we need in this time. So I gotta say, under different leadership, if it wasn't for the leadership of Governor DeSantis and Secretary Mayhew, this, this doesn't happen. And this is saving a lot of lives. And one of the things one of the residents in there said to our speech therapist, Vicki, who's around here somewhere, um, you know, thank you for treating us like human beings. You know, I think we get lost in the fact of we got a lot of numbers out there, but these are real, decent, good people that need help. And it's amazing what these folks are doing on there in the front lines and risking their lives. Thank you to Artis Gilmore and our other uh, two partners, Greg and Denise, that are in Ohio. That's all you all want to hear from me. But thank you all for the support in Florida and for Governor DeSantis and Secretary Mayhew. All right. And so we're excited about uh, the antibody testing tomorrow. Uh, we've also sent that to hospitals who, who have requested it. So I know a lot of the hospitals are going to be testing their uh, uh, frontline staff, the nurses and the doctors, and we obviously encourage that. We're also going to be partnering with folks and maybe uh, President Kassi, you want to do the J JU, we're, part we're going to be partnering with some research institutions to do seroprevalence studies in different parts of the state. We've had one done with uh, Miami-Dade County, partnered with the University of Miami to do a seroprevalence study in Dade County. And that found that at the time, Dade had about 10,000 documented infections. And they estimated that there were probably 160,000 people in the county that had antibodies. So that's important to know. It lets you know the, the severity, the chance risk of hospitalization, and then obviously the prevalence of the antibodies. So we're, we would like to do one probably here. What you'd need is a scientifically representative sample, probably a few thousand people. Uh, and you would need to, need to do it um, in a way that, um, uh, that, that kind of pass muster to be able to draw conclusions from. But I think that we, we should be able to do that. That. So we're looking at doing one in Broward, but I think 
Orlando, Tampa, Jacksonville would be obvious candidates as well. And with that, I'm happy to take some questions. So first, uh, the state, uh, the DEO, uh, over the last six weeks has paid out $1.1 billion in benefits to Floridians. Uh, that represents uh, roughly half a million individual claimants that have been paid. Yesterday, for example, uh, they sent out uh, 150,000 uh, payments uh, to folks. And so this was a system that was obviously very problematic. There's been a lot of work done to get money out. There's still work being done on it every day, uh, but we are at a situation where $1.1 billion has been paid out. In terms of the investigation, it's going to be, this was a, um, a system that the state paid. Again, I was not here for this, but they paid $77 million for this thing. And when we brought in engineers to, to fix this, they said that this thing was, was very flawed and that it was just simply not worth the money. So we need to figure out how that went. And, um, and so, yes, we, we've ordered it. Uh, how, how long that'll take, I don't know. Obviously, my focus is on getting the, the checks out. We've worked very hard to do that. We've had, uh, finally had some success. We've got to do more, but that's going to be the most important thing. And then I'd imagine when the dust settles, we'll be able to get some, some answers about why a $77 million uh, system not only, look, this was a historic spike. You look at these numbers around the country, it is tragic what is going on with unemployment to have this many people nationwide out of work. We've mitigated that damage here in Florida because of the way we've managed it. We've kept a lot of things going, like construction. I, I, I uh, um, escalated road projects in places like Orlando, Tampa, Miami, which I think is going to be very, very fruitful. So we approached it a little bit differently, but obviously our tourism sector, some of these other sectors have been hit. But if you look at that, uh, those, are, those are human lives that are affected. Now you have people in some of these areas um, around the country, I'm looking, that have no end in sight right now. You know, we've laid out a very clear path to get back to business. Phase one, two, and three, we're moving very well on that. But you got some of these other places, these folks really have no, no light at the end of the tunnel, and, and I really worry about that. So here in Florida, we obviously want to get people the, the cash, but just as importantly, you know, we want to lay that foundation to get back so that people are able to go back to work, so that people are able to, to do their small businesses like they used to, because the effect of having a protracted downturn of this magnitude would be absolutely catastrophic, not just in terms of economy, but in terms of the social fabric and in terms of public health. And so we're going in a smart, safe, and step-by-step -step way to get back, and I think that's the only appropriate way to do it. We'll do the next one. So what we have here is when people are filing claims, you have to go through a process. Obviously, if you weren't working, you're just not eligible for unemployment. That's just the way it is. So all this stuff is vetted. You got to have a social security number, all this stuff. There's some people who just don't qualify for unemployment, but may qualify for pandemic relief. And so that is now starting to be paid out. The federal government didn't send us the money until very recently. So there is some pandemic assistance that'll be available for people that don't qualify for unemployment. I'm also looking at ways where we can help some of our small businesses. When this first started, I authorized 50 million in bridge loans for small businesses because we knew the federal government was doing this PPP program. So our loan program is pretty generous, but PPP is definitely better because the, the banks, for, the federal government forgives the loan. So we did that, they used it, then you have PPP, you've had two rounds of PPP, uh, but unfortunately what you're finding is some of the bigger companies are getting the money, and I've got small businesses who haven't been able to get anything. So these are folks that have, their costs are not tens of millions of dollars. Their costs are smaller, but they have bills, and if they can't do business, then how are they going to pay the bills? So I want to get PPP money to them. So we're working on ways that we can do that. There have definitely been some, I would say, bad actors of people, companies who have gotten millions and millions of dollars, 
who were never forced to close, who were continuing to operate, and they just took the advantage of that to be able to do it. I wanted that money going for folks so that they can continue their business operations. A small business to just be put out, or even a 50% reduction for two months, is very different from a big corporation doing it. So we've got to do that. And I am going to look at ways where we could potentially use some of the other state programs because we have CARES Act money. There may be ways where we can do some small business loans. But these, these are going to be key towards mom and pop type businesses, you know, family owned type businesses. You know, I don't want this stuff going to some of these multinational corporations. I think that was really, really wrong to have some of those businesses taking that. And I would say any business in Florida that has taken it should return it and we need to get it to the, in the hands of the small business folks. Yep. So it's a great question. So early on on this in this, uh, the we restricted visitation because we didn't know who was carrying the disease. You have someone go in and they may not have even shown symptoms. You could have had an outbreak. So so we restricted visitation the nursing homes and then obviously all the staff needed to be screened, and and I think that 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 had to be done. But that was a very difficult thing to do because you have folks at these facilities who are not able to have personal contact with their loved ones. And you'd have sons and daughters that would go visit their moms and dads uh, all the time. And then that's been taken away. And that was done out of an abundance of caution. But I recognize that that causes problems too. And I recognize there's probably some residents who say, you know, we think we're safe enough. Like, I think it's low risk. I would, I would want to be able to see family. So what I've told folks at both the Department of Health um, and I've told Secretary Mayhew is, uh, let's figure out a way where we can bring in visitors safely. Maybe that means they do a rapid test before they go in. Maybe some of the ones that have antibodies, maybe they wear PPE. Uh, but we've got to figure out a way to do that uh, that's not going to present a risk to the other, uh, the other residents here. I think you can. And I think we're now at a portion where we're doing a lot of testing in these facilities. Uh, you have a lot of the staff that's being tested, and uh, that's a good thing. We need to keep doing that. But we have more tools at our disposal today than we did two months ago. But I do worry about the toll that that takes on people, families emotionally. And also just if you think about what the hospitals did by restricting access to the hospitals. And again, that was done for good reason. You have an infectious disease. People were very, it's very contagious. People are worried about that. But what's happened is, and not just for COVID patients, you have other patients who are in the hospital, people that have real serious conditions, people that are on their deathbed and they don't have they're not allowed to have a family member there to hold their hand, to say goodbye, uh, to hug them one last time. Uh, those are moments that you just can't get back, uh, but that's in a tremendous social cost to doing these protective measures. And so I think that we're very creative people. We've got to figure out a way um, you know, to go on a next step where you can do this. I know the hospitals have, um, you know, they've done a lot of great stuff throughout the state of having the COVID wings, but they have so much, uh, so many protections. And you hear different things across the country about how it, it's really rampant in hospitals. Everyone gets it. I'll tell you, in Florida, that has not been the case. I mean, uh, I was at Tampa General. All of their staff that has had it to this point brought it in from somewhere else, mostly New York City. They, they don't have any evidence of an actual infection occurring in the hospital. Now, I'm sure it's happened some places. But it's been rare, and I think that that's a good thing. But yeah, I think getting the visitation, we've got to do it right. We've got to make sure everything is done safely. And I don't know whether that's a, an Abbott Labs instant test, a Cepheid 45-minute test. Maybe it's just wearing the PPE. Uh, but I think we've got to work together. So I'm going to work with Mary and the Department of Health and, and the other agencies uh, to, to try to figure out uh, how, how we step forward. And I think the hospitals, too, need to, need to look at it. I mean, the good thing about where we are now is that for the most part of the pandemic, the hospitals in Florida were half empty. 
I mean, we, ne we had more space in our hospitals on April 24th, which is the date that some of the newspapers in Florida said we'd have 464,000 people hospitalized for COVID. Now, we only have 70,000 hospital beds, so to have that many, that would break the system. You'd have mass misery, but they were actually writing things like that. Um, but yet, if you actually go to April 24th, the hospitals were effectively half empty. You're going to start seeing more of these beds taken up because elective surgeries are back online. Uh, but the bottom line is, you know, all the hospitals have had capacity throughout this whole time period. All of them, even with doing elective surgeries, understand the need to uh, prepare in case there's an uptick. And I think all of them are very, very confident that they're going to be able to, to meet that. But I just worry about if someone's in the, if someone's in the hospital um, you know, for cancer or something very terminal, to not be able to have that family interaction, uh, I think that that's, uh, that's tough. And, and we've just got to figure out a way uh, to, to deal with that. So I, I, don't, I can't announce anything right now. I don't know that we're there yet, but we've got to get there. So we, um, we considered this for phase one, and my view is, is, okay, we need to talk with doctors, we need to talk with the industry, we need to figure out what would make sense uh, to reduce risk. But my view is, is if you have something where there's interaction, if you can do things like mask and other things that would make it low risk, then we've got to figure out a way to do that. So I went last weekend, uh, last Saturday, I was down in Orange County, Mayor of Orange County, Jerry Demings wrote me a letter uh, asking me to, to put the hair, hair salons and barber shops back online. So we were able to meet uh, at a salon uh, with the owner and then owners of some other shops and then some physicians. And they were all talking about, here's what we would do. And I think the ideas are great. So those ideas have been taken, they've been internalized. The health has looked at them, other physicians have looked at them. So I think it's going in a really good direction. So I think people that are, that look, I mean, I have practically have a mullet, so I haven't had a haircut in a long time. Um, but you know, we just wanna make sure we're going in a safe, smart, step-by-step -step approach. We're being very judicious on everything we're doing, but I absolutely see a path. And I think if people um, uh, watch out, uh, I think that you'll be hearing something on that very soon. So thank you all for coming out, appreciate it.